68. Ronald J. Trump has completed his 13th term as cyborg president of planet Earth. Surveying the desolate landscape are a few good apprentices. They are leading the rebel uprising to save planet Earth. Their mission, restore truth before fresh water and clean air are but a distant memory. Captain Catherine has recently returned from her voyage into the future. It all started at KPFA with a group of apprentices who were trained by the First Voice Apprenticeship Program. Do you have what it takes? Will the truth prevail? You too can be part of the resistance. Check out kpfaapprentice.org to apply, or if you have questions, dial our Rebel Headquarters at 510-848-6767, extension 235. The application for this tuition-free program is due on Friday, March 30th at 5 p.m. The resistance needs your voice. And you are listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online at kpfa.org. The time is a minute past 2 p.m. Stay tuned next for Terra Verde. Uh, From the Amazon Basin, from the magnificent redwoods of California to the icy majesty of the Arctic, life on Earth faces an unprecedented threat from careless development. Join Terra Verde over lunch today to find out about the unfolding future of the planet. Hello and welcome to Terra Verde, a weekly KPFA environmental radio show. I am your host this week, Gary Hughes, and I am joined today by R. L. Miller, founder and president of Climate Hawks Vote Political Action, an organization that is dedicated to electing candidates with strong climate policy platforms to political office. As the 2018 election season begins to heat up, it is great to have R.L. on Terra Verde to get a full briefing on some key races nationally and especially in California to learn about opportunities to see real climate leaders campaign for and be elected to important offices. R.L. is joining us by phone. How are you doing today, R.L.? I am doing well, Gary. Thank you so much for having me on Terra Verde. And thanks to all the listeners tuned in to KPFA. Excellent, R.L. Thanks so much for making this happen. I really appreciate having you on the show. I know this is going to be a great show. Uh, before we get started with R.L. giving us the scoop on some of the major electoral races ahead of us in the big election year, I do want to remind listeners that Terra Verde is on every Friday at this hour and that we are looking ahead to the rest of 2018 with great excitement. It is very much an honor to be here as a community radio volunteer. On behalf of the entire collective of Terra Verde program hosts, I want to say thank you to all the KPFA staff and volunteers that make it possible for us to be here in the studio on a weekly basis. We will continue to work hard this year, bringing listeners news and insights about environmental protection and related social justice issues here in the San Francisco Bay Area, across the state and the nation, and indeed around the world. We truly believe in the power of independent community radio. Be sure to take advantage of the easy options for donating and supporting KPFA radio by going to kpfa.org and following the donate button at the top of the page. Now in just a couple of weeks, it'll be KPFA's birthday. This is an excellent time to make a gift to your premier community radio station. Remember, community radio truly gets the goods now more than ever. Well, KPFA family, I think that having R.L. Miller from Climate Hawks Vote is going to be a prime example of how we are bringing listeners radio programming that is unique and special. To get started and to set the scene, let's hear from you, R.L., some of the history of Climate Hawks Vote, like how and when you got started in this line of organizing. You know, everybody asks me, and I say Sarah Palin, which is such an odd thing to say, but for the longest time, I was a stay-at-home, no, I wasn't stay-at-home, I was a lawyer, but I also was a mom, and I did mom things, and I drove my kids to the field trips, and then when he got into... Uh, 
a roller hockey. I schlepped his gear to the rink. And then when he got into jazz band, I um, ran the bake sales at the high school. The kind of things that any mom would do. Sarah Palin gets nominated. I look at a resume, which is really similar to mine, and I go, community organizer. Whoa. Hockey mom. Yeah. Absolutely unqualified to be vice president of the United States. Yeah. (laughs) And so I discovered the liberal blogosphere, um, started blogging on a place called Daily Coast. I'm sure listeners here are familiar with it. And discovered that I had a knack for things. I looked around at the world, had always been one of those kids who wanted to save the rainforest without really knowing where it was and saving the tigers without really knowing why they needed to be saved and realized that we have a problem with climate change. And it's not just tigers in rainforests in faraway places. It's happening right here, right now. In Southern California, where I live, wildfire season used to go from September 1st to the first rains in November. Now it goes from September 1st to August 31st. And you're lucky if you have any rains in November. (laughs) And then when the rains come, it's torrential. Right, right. Right now I'm looking out at a Pineapple Express um, that is drenching hillsides that were denuded by a fire that was being fought on Christmas Day. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, things are different. (laughs) Um, So I got into... Um, as I say, first blogging, and then people asked me to get involved in state Democratic Party politics. And on the one hand, I really appreciated a lot of green groups that were 501c3s, which is to say they do educational and charitable work. And they're very good at what they do, which is writing extremely articulate, well-informed reports saying, wake up, we have a problem about climate change. And on the other hand, democratic politics, where you need to win, you need to do things like count votes to stay in office, you need to fundraise, you need to occasionally make compromises to get legislation passed, and they don't prioritize climate change. And so I came up with the idea of Climate Hawks Vote to be at that intersection of climate policy and politics. And so what we do is we try to find people who are really fierce on climate policy, not just any Democrat who hugged a tree yesterday, and instead look for real leaders and try to get them elected to office. Uh, And that's what we do in a nutshell. (laughs) And you're not by yourself. You have partners in the organization, and um, it's not just California. Right. We're a national organization. Um, I have an executive director in D.C., and we are looking to staff up right now. Um, We've just finished a race in Illinois. We found a candidate by the name of Sean Caston um, who ran on a very wonky – he started off as a very wonky science-oriented guy. Um, His brother called him a dork. (laughs) I think it's a family thing. Um, But he came up with an idea for – essentially recycling waste electri- uh, waste heat and electricity from generators. And he built this into quite a little niche that is actually contributing to climate change solutions. And he decided to run as a to run for office as a scientist. So he had a Democratic primary with seven candidates in the Democratic primary. This is one of those red to blue Clinton Republican seats where we're talking about a House voted. seat, correct? Uh, rep- yes. House of Representatives. Yes, yeah. this is Illinois House. This is Illinois Six, and the election was Tuesday, March twentieth, and I was up until three in the morning, um, <laughs> and some point around Wednesday. Around 5 in the morning, it was announced that, yes, he ended up um, coming from behind and beating the front runner. And so he's going on to face a guy named Peter Roskam, who's a climate denier, in November. And that'll be a fun race, and we'll be staying involved in it through November. That's pretty exciting. I'd like to dig into this a little bit more, though a big part of our show is going to focus on California. But these events in Illinois are really interesting because of the work that you are doing in many key congressional races around the nation. Um, But what are the metrics really that you're using so that a potential candidate really rises up to the level where you're saying this is this is someone 
that we really believe demonstrates the climate leadership that we're looking for? How, how did, how did um, this candidate, uh, you know, really rise up to that level for you? And the short answer is that I'm very picky about who we take on. And I've got a very good ear to the ground nationwide. Um, so I always tell people we don't do questionnaires because candidates tell me one thing on questionnaires and they tell the National Rifle Association something else on the NRA questionnaire. And they don't, pro- they don't prioritize. They, what they say on a questionnaire does not tell me that they will prioritize my group or my policies when they get elected. So I look for a track record. I look for um, clean energy entrepreneurs who have actually done something um, in that space and shown that you can um, create jobs, which is very important to Americans (laughs) and to our economy, while at the same time um, innovating and growing the economy and at the same time working to reduce our carbon emissions. We look for activists. We look for people who has built a reputation by fighting pipelines. We look for legislative leaders who have been active in the state house or in a city council and looking to come up to, to move up to the next level. So we look for people with a track record and we do surveys in the districts to ask people what they think. Should we support this candidate or that candidate? I'll tell you right now that I have surveys out in Iowa's first district, in Montana, the entire state, and in Ohio's 16th district, which is the western Cleveland suburbs. And we, because we're grassroots and we respect our grassroots members. And if we think that somebody looks good on paper, but our grassroots people say, no, 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 we respect our grassroots. So, and then you must uh, run into some pushback, though, within the party, as it were, when you, you know, start to really support one candidate and there are other political factions within, within the party. What, what kind of, what kind of uh, you know, friction or, or, or this kind of resistance do you confront sometimes when you try to make such a high priority of, of climate issues? And, and how do you respond? How do you explain why climate and and climate policy is is such an important factor in electing uh, responsible uh, public office holders right now climate touches everything it's people tend to leave it to the green groups they tend to leave it they tend to think that oh the cr club friends of the earth league of conservation voters they'll go solve climate and that's absolutely not true it's a national security issue it's an economic issue it's a public health issue and everybody needs to be involved or to um, borrow a cliche to change everything we need everyone involved and so yes i'm i'm accustomed to getting some pushback from other groups but In a way, that's a good thing. Um, I'm a California Democratic Party insider. I'm the chair of the state Democratic Party's Environmental Caucus. And sometimes I have to fight my party. And I don't mind. Sometimes I win. Last cycle, um, the party endorsed for Congress a guy in California 44 who I felt was an oily Democrat, took a lot of money from the oil industry. Um, I backed Nanette Barragon, Climate Hawks vote backed Nanette Barragon, who I felt was a proven fracking fighter. She had a real track record as well as political skill in explaining climate change in a way that made sense to the people of her district. And that matters because elections are always local. You always need to talk to your district, not talk about what's happening in the Arctic. And so I backed her, and I know I made some enemies within the party, but you know what? We won. <laughs> and I should add that I w- that Climate Hawks vote won eight of our ten races last cycle, and I will match that. I will put up that track record against any other national green group in the in the country. Well, I think that's a really important pivot right now. Um, how you described your involvement with uh, these races here in California. As we all know, anyone who's really paying close attention to how uh, politics are, you know, evolving here in California, we know that fossil fuel money, big oil money, oil money is is a major 
issue. And so I think it'd be really great for listeners to hear a little bit from you about the standards that Climate Hawks Vote maintains. And then and as well, I know it's related to work that you have been doing with a broad coalition of other grassroots organizations here in California who are concerned about oil money in California uh, politics. What, what are some, um, you know, dynamics around that that you'd like to point out to KPFA listeners? And how does Climate Hawks Vote really make a difference about oil in oil money in California politics? So, little known fact, um, we have an oil-drenched supermajority in the California state legislature. And by that, I mean that 90, approximately 90 of our 120 state legislators have taken money from the oil companies. And that's not acceptable. And so I've sort of declared war on that. Um, And I'm fortunate to be working with a great coalition of people. David Braun at Roots Keeper has set up the group Oil Money Out. I believe you can find it at oilmoneyout.com. And I've actually had David Um, as a guest on the show previously. Yep, he's he's great. And so um, David and I worked together and along with a big coalition um, to, we ended up delivering 80,000 signatures on a petition to Jerry Brown and the legislators. But what I've done specifically within the party is I have a rule that if any candidate wants to come and talk to my caucus at the state party convention, they have to publicly sign a pledge that they won't take money from the oil industry or explain to 300 fierce activists why they won't sign that pledge. But Oddly, nobody's taken that particular, (laughs) decided to go that particular route. Um, Usually if they're oil-drenched Democrats and they hear that I make them take a pledge, then they don't show up. Um, (laughs) I'm actually really upset right now because one of the candidates in California 39 signed that pledge, but he owns a lot of stock in oil companies. Um, He owns a lot of stock in Exxon, in and and Darko in some of the fracking um, companies in Texas. I just got the documents last night, and I'm trying to strategize around how I'm going to handle that. Luckily, we've backed one of his opponents. <laughs> well, this we'll continue with this. I just want to remind listeners that you're tuned in to Terra Verde on KPFA 94.1 FM. My name is Gary Hughes. I'm your host today, and I am speaking with R.L. Miller, founder and president of Climate Hawks Vote Political Action, And we're speaking about the imperative of electing candidates with a firm commitment to climate action, to public office. And we've just like organically, you know, flowed into this uh, question about uh, the tentacles, as it were, of Exxon and how deeply they run in this state. And, um, you know, it'll be really interesting as you dig into these documents, you get to reveal a little bit more to us. And it'll be great to hear what happens with a candidate who... Uh, makes this gesture of not taking any donations from from big oil yet has all sorts of uh, economic compromises. But uh, when it comes to Exxon, there is this question of Exxon New. And of course, we who have been tracking Exxon New and the work in New York and Massachusetts by the attorneys general of those states to to explore and investigate Exxon's uh, climate fraud and climate denial, uh, it's been a big... um, you know, b- b- baffling situation here that California's Attorney General uh, Becerra ha- has not taken action. Now, RL, what what is going on there with AG Becerra and uh, the lack of action on Exxon New? He's stonewalling us. And to be really clear about this, there is a file in the Attorney General's office that was open in October of 2015. This was confirmed to me by somebody in the AG's office. And I originally asked Kamala Harris, who at that point was the AG, what was going on. And she confirmed that she had the, she had the file, or rather her office confirmed anonymously, I should say. Uh, uh, her office confirmed that she had the file and it was open and there was an ongoing investigation. And based on that, we gave her a climate hawks vote endorsement and played a very small role in helping to get her elected to the United States Senate. And I'm very proud of her. But fast forward to Javier Becerra, 
and we figure that okay, he's not he's a little he's not running for U.S. Senate. He may be a little more um, willing to move on this, and so we all participated. Lots of us participated in gathering signatures on petitions, and in April of last year, eleven months ago, um, I drove to his office in Los Angeles and presented him with part of seventy thousand signatures and part of a huge coalition that involved Credo, involved Friends of the Earth, um, involved Greenpeace. I don't remember everybody else who was involved, but we all delivered signatures and we were told very nicely, oh, thank you so much. We'll let you know if he decides to act. And ever since then, he's been stonewalling us. I have given up. I have personally, this is not Climate Hawks vote, this is simply R.L. Miller speaking, I have personally endorsed Dave Jones because Dave Jones has shown political courage. I asked him in front of a bunch of Hollywood executives if he would commit to investigating and, if needed, prosecuting Exxon. And without batting an eye, without blinking, Dave Jones said yes, he would commit to doing so in front of a a bunch of very, very well-heeled Hollywood folk. And so I've been very disappointed by Javier Becerra. Becerra does take oil money. I know that Philip 66 has maxed out to him. This is very disturbing considering that Philip 66 is a major player in some Bay Area activities um, with respect to shipping oil through the, through the Bay. Um, not something that I think is a terribly bright idea. And I consider Becerra's silence on this to be I don't think it's baffling. I think it's pretty easy to understand. He just doesn't want to give us an answer. And the answer is that he's not going to get involved. It is really a great case study in looking at the influence of oil money in California politics. As you mentioned, we know that Becerra has taken money from Philip 66. Also, um, we know that he's taken money from Chevron and a, another fossil fuel company called the California Resources Company. So you that's know, the it, Occidental spinoff, right? It is it is one of those instances where, as you know, a common resident and voter, you're kind of looking at the playing field, and um, it does it doesn't doesn't take a lot of rocket science sometimes to to draw conclusions. Um, so that's going to be a really interesting race to watch what happens. Uh, but there's some other things going on in California politics, and I really want to make sure that we touch on these as as the show continues. We get um, actually closer to the end. And really, I think one of the most exciting and interesting campaigns to discuss is the campaign for the United States Senate and the candidacy of Kevin DeLeon. Now, I know you're uh, watching this r- really closely and you're involved um, can can you tell us a little bit about what makes De Leon a candidate um, that that r- helps him rise to the level of being a climate leader, and and how does this uh, compare and contrast perhaps with uh, his opponent, the incumbent uh, Senator Feinstein, and and whether or not she has actually really um, served her constituency on climate issues. So Climate Hawks Vote endorsed Kevin DeLeon. He was actually the very first endorsement that we issued this cycle. And we did so after sending out a survey to our entire California list of 30,000 plus people. And our list told us by a ratio of two to one that they prefer DeLeon to Dianne Feinstein. And I'd like to think that it's because of his extraordinary track record in writing the bills that we are that we need in California. So in 2015, he wrote SB 350, get California to 100 to 50% renewable electricity by 2030. Then this year he decided that that was not ambitious enough. And so he's been working on trying to pass SB 100, bringing us to 100% renewable clean electricity by 2045. It's a bold, ambitious goal. It's right up there with the Off Fossil Fuels Act and the Merkley-Sanders 100 by 50 bills circulating in the United States Congress. And it has a decent shot at passing. And that's the kind of thing that I'm looking for, not somebody who will simply be a reliable vote, but somebody who will get down in the trenches 
pass, write the bills that we need to see, and then work to get those bills passed. He has an extraordinary track record. Um, He talks to the Pope. Um, He educates the Pope on how we do things in California. And um, he's just a serious leader who I think could be a transformational figure in the United States Senate. And the fact that he's also extraordinarily good on other issues helps, too. He will walk into the Senate head and shoulders above anybody else on the subject of immigration, for example. And I think it's also really important to point out the history of this bill, SB 350, that passed and set this renewables goal of um, 50 percent renewable electricity by 2030, is that there was another really important element to that bill that did not uh, make it to the finish line, as it were, but that was one of the boldest uh, gestures when it comes to climate and energy policy in California. And that was um, that was related to basically getting California off of, um, you know, gasoline, uh, as it were, right. by a certain day. Can you, can you describe that element of that bill a little bit more, just so that listeners have an idea of De Leon's track record and the kind of bold gestures, the, goal, the bold uh, objectives that he tries to set with the legislation? It was, the part that did not pass was a part that would have required 50% less petroleum use in California by 2030. And the oil companies freaked out because what that meant to them was 50% less profits, and we can't have that. (laughs) And so they ran these ads saying that you are schlepping your kids to the grocery store and you only have enough gas to get them to the store, but not enough gas to get them back from the store, (laughs) which was incredibly deceptive. The way that California would have met those goals, the bill had a pretty good explanation as to how you do it and it's basically by doing things like encouraging transit you know the smart things um and the oil companies just came after that bill hard and it wasn't anything that he did or didn't do it was entirely within the uh, the state assembly he runs the state senate they passed the bill um the state assembly specifically the 20 or so oily democrats um, were the ones who had problems with that bill, and they were the ones who managed to get the bill killed for and never put up for a vote. Uh, so we are trying to go after those oily Democrats. And then I guess it's it's really important to, to also hold these candidates to high standards, and so I wanted to play a little bit of the devil's advocate here because uh, regardless of De Leon's excellent track record, um, clearly the pro tem uh, made... Uh, um, you know, an error, as it were, in in many grassroots uh, organizations' perception in his support for the cap-and-trade reauthorization last summer. And I'm, you know, really curious from your perspective, is it a problem that he's not being held really fiercely uh, to account for having supported this pollution trading bill? Can, Can we give him a pass? And then what is the concern, if he were to make it to the U.S. Senate, that, um, you know, that this idea of a freewheeling, big oil-friendly carbon market actually becomes, you know, something that the U.S. Congress um, finally embraces and, and he becomes a, a supporter of policy like that. I mean, how, what's your take on, on those uh, dynamics and possibilities? Sure. Um, and people, please remember that KDL support had an original bill drafted, SB 775, that it was difficult to explain in sound bites, but provided a cap and dividend to people. A massive reform, be, massive reform yes. on the carbon market. Right, and so he was um, championing championing that bill, but Jerry Brown froze him out of talks. Simply would not return his phone calls on dealing with that bill. And so after a while, it became pretty obvious that Brown was throttling SB 775. And so KDL, who is a good political team player, um, got on board with the cap and trade bill. I oppose that cap and trade bill. Um, I helped put together the coalition 
that opposed of environmental justice and other advocates who oppose that bill. Yeah, that was excellent work, Not- RL. And I'm sorry to cut you off right here. We're getting right to the end of the show. We had such a juicy piece of conversation, but I want to make absolutely sure that listeners know how they can get more information and stay involved. I'm so sorry to cut you off like that, but we really want to make sure that people know about climatehawksvote.com for more info. Can you tell yes. us more? Climate hawks as in the birds vote.com you can follow us on twitter